Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Catherine Adcox and I'm a volunteer with the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. Tonight we are featuring a talk about the history and development of ceramics in California, where you'll learn about some fascinating artists. Before we get started with the program, I would like to take a moment to review a few technical details. This is a live webinar. It will be recorded. The audio for the audience has been muted and the audience video has been turned off. So you will only hear and see the speaker, her slides and me. At the request of our viewers, we have enabled closed captioning, which you can turn on at any point. Please use the chat to introduce yourself, to make comments and to ask questions throughout the presentation. We do monitor the chat and ask that you please be respectful in your comments. Before I turn things over to our wonderful speaker, I'd like to take talk briefly about the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. We are a nonprofit organization that raises funds and advocates for an exceptional, advocates for an exceptional public library in Alameda. We would like to give a special thanks to our supporters for their ongoing donations so we can honor our commitments to the library and to support a free and to support future Friends at Home events. We ask that you please consider a donation to the Friends in any amount that is comfortable for you via our website, alamedafriends.com, or by using the direct link in the chat. Now for tonight's program, our fabulous speaker is likely a familiar face to many of you from past art docent talks. Avril Angevine is an independent art lecturer who has spoken at the Alameda Free Library many times. She's a humanities and English instructor at local colleges and a museum guide at both SF MoMA and the Oakland Museum of California. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome back to Friends at Home. I am delighted to turn things over to April. Okay, <clears throat> that's good. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, everybody. I'm uh, glad to see you all here tonight, even though I can't see you. I know you're there. And um, let's talk tabletop tonight. Dishes on your table. California has uh, produced lots of them. So I'm going to share the screen. Here we are. For anybody who's interested in art, design, culture of any sort, and I know that means you, California looms large. In addition to noteworthy, influential architects like Charles and Ray Eames and painters like our local favorite Wayne Tebow and photographers and other local favorite Dorothea Lange, uh, our state has produced more down market design icons too from movies and movie stuff to surfboards and surfwear and surf music to faux mission Taco Bell style architecture uh, to the psychedelic rock posters. Remember these from Haight-Ashbury back in the 60s and 70s to everything Apple and everything Disney. It all comes from California. And it's in this less elevated realm that we find California's pottery tradition. California has produced both handcrafted and industrially made goods from architectural tiles and decoration to all sorts of tabletop items to the small figurines sometimes known <clears throat> as tchotchkes, which were in fact the earliest known form of pottery. So what accounts for California's uh, importance in the ceramic world? Well, we have abundant clay deposits, inventive designers, Asian and Latin American influences known, little known elsewhere in the country, and the needs of a burgeoning population all helped propel the growth of California pottery from the turn of the 20th century to the post-war years of mid-century modernism and into our times. Okay, so let's begin our California story uh, from the beginning. So indigenous peoples in California have been pit firing clay artifacts, pots for cooking and storing food, and even some figurines uh, for thousands of years. This is not everywhere in California, but in specific areas, particularly in the southeast in the desert areas, this is a cajuela cooking pot. Uh, they were frequent. Meanwhile, in the mission era, from the late 18th century through about 1833, we find the first clay multiples, terracotta pavers, tiles, bricks, and kind of rough tabletop wares uh, produced locally often by neophytes, which were the indigenous trainees who were taught to do everything that was needed to be done in the mission, including creating um, uh, pottery of some sorts. 
the more prestigious objects they needed would be imported from Mexico. But the modern uh, sort of ceramic story in California starts with the gold rush, of course, that is with the influx of European origin Americans into the state following that momentous discovery, <laughs> wonderful and terrible at the same time. Many settlers would have brought their own wares with them. Joan Didion, for example, has a wonderful story about a potato masher brought by her pioneer ancestors. But if the pioneers came empty handed, what they wanted were European inspired products like they had back home, plates with floral decoration in porcelain or in imitation of porcelain. And you could buy things like this at Gump's, for example, which was founded in 1861 in San Francisco. They had plenty of it just piled up for people to buy. But a truly local art pottery, uh, art production, pottery production finally arrived in the late 19th and early 20th century when arts and crafts style in architecture and interior design roared across the country, right? So this is a style that was based on the work of William Morris in England. Arts and crafts came about in reaction to the perceived ugliness or perhaps the actual ugliness uh, of mass produced consumer objects made possible by the rise of factories in the 18th and 19th centuries. It corresponded to a vogue for medieval art and craft. And looking back to a pre-industrial age, the arts and crafts style stressed handwork, restrained nature-based decoration and interior design uh, as an integrated system, as you can see here in the wonderful Gamble House by the architects Green and Green in Pasadena. Here's a screen, uh, arts and crafts style screen by um, Arthur and Lucia Matthews, uh, Northern California's important arts and crafts couple, and a window there on the left by Charles Rennie McIntosh, a Scottish arts and crafts designer. Now, much arts and crafts work features the same misty, cool, tonalist colors that we associate with Liberty Prints. Liberty, the store in London, opened in 1875 and the same colors we associate with Northern California's tonalist art, like the fabulous moon rising over Tiburon by Granville Redmond, which is at the Oakland Museum. And if you haven't seen it, I insist that you rush down there and do so, it's wonderful. So arts and crafts style inspired the state's first art potters, such as the Stockton Art Pottery, which produced this beautiful Rexton ware, in addition to tiles and sewer pipes, which were important early ceramic pro products in California. Uh, this is a company that was only operating for five years before the plant burned down in 1902. And you can see there, particularly uh, the one on the right, this face has a really organic, arts and crafts, Art Nouveau almost style took it to it. Meanwhile, in 1911, another short-lived art pottery, which turned out beautiful arts and crafts style wares and is probably unique in ceramic history. And that's the Arequipa pottery firm of Fairfax in Marin County, founded in 1911 as part of the occupational therapy program at a tuberculosis sanitarium. So following the 1906 earthquake, dirt and ash-filled air led to an epidemic of tuberculosis in the city, which hit women much harder than men. Now, at the time, the only treatment for tuberculosis was rest and inactivity. <laughs> they're, part of, they're the same thing, I guess. Uh, so it was a luxury, right? Uh, but this sanitarium founded by Dr. Philip Brown uh, was designed to treat working class women in the early stages of tuberculosis. Now the idea of occupational therapy was brand new. And since China painting was an activity much practiced by proper ladies at the time, pottery was chosen as a handicraft that could provide satisfaction to the patients and give them something to do expressed at the time as discouraging idleness. The patients spent a few hours every day finishing and decorating the pots, either designs painted on the surface or patterns carved into the damp clay and they earned money to keep from their sometimes admittedly lumpy work. Most of the clay used in the pottery was dug locally. Production was directed by some well-known ceramicists, including a man named Frederick Reed, an Englishman. Uh, they were responsible for the shapes of the ware uh, and the women for the decoration. 
Reed introduced slip trailing. Uh, slip is watery clay, a technique which became the signature form of decoration of Arequipa pottery. Now, in 1915, at the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco, the Arequipa Tuberculosis Sanitarium exhibited its ceramic works in the fair's Palace of Education, where discharged patients demonstrated pottery making and sold examples uh, of the product. I love this uh, picture of the um, exhibition here. Even the font, even the typeface on their sign is so arts and crafts. It's so, uh, so much of the time. Let's look at some of their works. Uh, the Oakland Museum has an outstanding collection of Arequipa pottery. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> okay, it's better. Uh, let's see. So this is uh, uh, designed by Reed. It's a squeeze bag decorated vase. In other words, a squeeze bag is almost like uh, a pottery, uh, I mean, a, a pastry bag to decorate a cake. That's how they put the slip on there. And then we have uh, an object like this, which is beautiful with this gunmetal glaze. And notice the pattern is of eucalyptus leaves. So um, California pottery in this period and even much later depended quite heavily on local flora and fauna for their designs, which made it um, unique. Uh, yes, okay, this big, beautiful floral one on the left, which is at the Oakland Museum. This one is pretty unusual for Arequipa and it was actually inspired by an actual William Morris wallpaper. And the one on the right uh, with the birds and the daffodils is at the Crocker Museum in Sacramento. So another Northern California pottery with an unusual workforce and a pottery considered by many to be the best of these was California Fayance in Berkeley. Uh, one of the longest enduring art potteries in California. Uh, California Fayance was established on San Pablo Avenue in Berkeley in 1913. And it was a partnership between two former college classmates. Uh, they were known for decorative and architectural tiles, uh, like these tea tile trivets. Some were also framed and hung on walls like paintings because they're absolutely beautiful. And designs varied from the simple to the ornate, although all the ones I have here seem fairly ornate. I don't see too many simple ones there. Botanical subjects were common, flowers like the California poppy, irises, morning glories, birds were common on tiles, architectural forms such as you see here with um, uh, the Campanile at UC Berkeley, Carmel Mission was another popular uh, architectural design, uh, landscapes, ships, all sorts of things. Now, as practicing arts and crafts workers, uh, the two owners, Bragdon and Thomas, personally supervised all aspects of design and manufacture. Their operation was always small with a handful of additional artists creating wares throughout the years, uh, including uh, the well-known sculptor, Benjamino Bufano, and a well-known local architect named Julia Morgan. All California Fayance works were done almost entirely by hand. They did use slip casting um, where liquid clay is poured into a mold and then poured out to create the form. In other words, they weren't all formed on a wheel or anything, but works like this still involve significant hand work. And as with Arequipa's arrangement with the sanitarium, several schools in the East Bay provided, uh, would have students make pieces from clay and glazes provided by California Fayance, which then sold the work. Uh, the longest relationship between a school and California Fayance was probably with Berkeley High School, which I find just like really, really interesting. So here we have uh, on the bottom left, a cast porcelain, that was actually porcelain uh, lemonade pitcher and glasses and this gray green art glaze and a couple of other really interesting shapes um, done by California Fayance. Now their biggest project, which required them moving to larger premises in 1921, uh, was tiles for Julia Morgan's Hearst Castle. Uh, this commission lasted 10 years and, and it produced an extraordinary range of tile works. And here's a portrait of the library there. Um, you know, you can put tile anywhere if you put your mind to it. As I said, the commission lasted 10 years. When it ended, the depression had begun, but uh, the two owners, Bragdon and Thomas, 
their innovative glazes and their new forms allowed them to keep producing until the 1950s, bringing their techniques to a new generation of consumers and artists. So they lasted a rather long time. Now, Southern California was not slow in catching up. And if you're familiar with LA's numerous bungalows, you'll know how important arts and crafts was down there as well. And in this regard, uh, the main person we're gonna talk about is Ernest Batchelder. His tile designs left a huge mark on homes and commercial structures in Southern California and in fact, across the country. He was born in New Hampshire in 1895 and moved to California in 1904 to teach at what is now Caltech. At the time, it was called the Throop Polytechnic Institute. So Batchelder was passionate about including handicrafts, what they called the manual arts, in education. But in 1909, he left his post um, at Caltech uh, to open a workshop on the Pasadena Arroyo he later opened a second workshop to produce bowls and vases like this, generally modern adaptations of Chinese earthenware designs uh, in extraordinary subtle arts and crafts kind of glazes. And his wonderful cottage on the Arroyo is still there and I think you can actually visit it. But as his logo suggested, uh, his main business and the source of his extraordinary influence was in tiles and other architectural panels, fireplace facings, fountains, and things like that, that fueled the building boom of the Roaring Twenties in Southern California. His California clay tiles were sold uh, from showrooms in San Francisco, in Chicago, in New York even. Batchelder tiles are considered a real estate asset uh, still, and they say that in certain older areas of Los Angeles, every third house has Batchelder tiles in it. So a catalog from the 1920s, here it is, shows that the company offered hundreds of unique tiles designed specifically for fireplaces and mantles, which could be ordered individually or in complete sets. And as you look at this, I'm sure you recognize some of these things. You've seen these things in houses here as well. Uh, these sets were evidently easy to assemble and could be safely shipped. There's a cluster of more than 50 homes in Wichita, Kansas with Batchelder fireplaces. So this idea is not so far-fetched, even in that early uh, pre-Amazon, uh, pre-Wayfair time. Uh, at the time, Sears was selling entire houses by mail order. Um, so the tiles that Batchelder made, let's see if we can see some here. Yeah, they were hand-pressed in plaster molds so that as his slogan exclaimed, no two tiles were the same. He used a process called engobe in which a wash of colored slip and pale blue was a popular color, was applied to the surface of the tile and it would pool in the recesses of the design. You wipe the excess off and then the tile was fired just once, unlike most glazed tile, which is fired twice. Many of Batchelder's designs were typical of local arts and crafts style, flowers, vines, and California oak. And what you see in front of you is very familiar looking um, local style. But he had other distinctive forms that set him apart too. Birds, uh, peacocks, Mayan and Byzantine patterns, and some things that were just uh, plain geometric. Now, one of Batchelder's early commissions was this over the top, Dutch chocolate shop first opened in 1914. <laughs> On the walls, there were 21 murals in bas relief. Um, the larger of them were maybe six feet by five feet, composed, comprised of four inch tiles depicting scenes of daily life in Holland. <laughs> this wonderful location uh, was boarded up beginning in the 1990s, but it was rediscovered in 2012 and the building is currently for sale. Possibly even more ornate uh, is the Fine Arts Building on 7th Street in downtown LA, uh, originally designed, believe it or not, uh, as artist studios, although I, I think it's used now as tech offices. So as much as I love tabletop and dishes and so forth, 
I still must talk about tile. It's such an important aspect of the ceramic story in California. And I must mention a Northern California company that has been in business continuously since 1875 and who made some of the most outrageous ceramic exterior cladding imaginable. And that's the Gladding McBean Company of Lincoln up in the Sierra foothills. Gladding at Bean supplied 3,200 tons of terracotta for the exterior of Timothy Pfluger's Pactel building at 140 New Montgomery. You know, it's right behind SF MoMA. You can see it really well when you go out um, uh, on the patio there. This building, which the examiner uh, at the time called a shimmering, gleaming monument to talk, and was the first building wired so that every desk could have a telephone, uh, was at the time, of course, the largest single order that Gladding McBean had filled. Ornamental flourishes include tons of bell imagery. Here's some, uh, including these. <laughs> mm, think about that for a minute. These are flying telephone books. They're very cool. And let's not forget the massive 13 foot high eagles on the top parapet, uh, a subtle assertion of uh, either American ascendancy or the ascendancy of Pacific Bell or something like that. Uh, so this building is terracotta, but it's actually glazed white terracotta. And so it shines in the sunlight and the dramatic lighting of the setback parapets at night really redefined the San Francisco skyline. And this was the tallest building in the city until the 1960s. And they also did the exterior of the spectacular Bullock's Wilshire building um, in Los Angeles that took only 1200 tons of tile and Oakland's Paramount Theater, they did that as well. Now, when we discuss the visual arts of Northern California, an important date is the 1915 Panama Pacific Exhibition in San Francisco, designed to celebrate not just the completion of the canal, but San Francisco's triumphant return uh, from the earthquake and fire of 1906. Um, uh, the exhibition brought modern art to Northern California and influenced uh, painting and visual arts extraordinarily. But for ceramic production, I have a picture of that? Yeah. yeah, there we go. For ceramic production, the more important exposition happened way down south. And that was San Diego's Panama, California International Exposition of the same year, 1915. And it had a similar result. It brought bright, sunshiny color into local ceramic work, which up until then had been dominated, as we've seen, by softer kind of tonalist tones. The architect of this pavilion, uh, who was a New Yorker, uh, ornamented the building with bright Spanish Moorish tiles, uh, like those used in Spain uh, since the Moors occupied the Iberian Peninsula in the eighth century. They had these rich opaque glazes that captivated ceramicists. And by the late twenties, local tile producers were applying a more Hispanic, Mexican, Spanish palette to their wares. Um, this also corresponded at the time uh, for a vogue for the romance of Spanish California of the mission era with the uh, publication of Ramona by uh, Helen Hunt Jackson in the 1880s and so forth. There was a move in this direction. Uh, a designer of the California Clay Company in San Diego, which created these tiles you're seeing, even moved to Arequipa in Marin County in 1916, bringing this bright style to the foggy Bay Area. So uh, absolutely central to this tile revolution, whoops, there's a uh, Malibu, was the Malibu pottery, which was providing tile for construction by 1927. Uh, its master ceramicist was Rufus Keeler, who died at age 49 after inhaling cyanide fumes from one of his glaze recipes. But um, the founder of the pottery was May Ringe, uh, widow of Frederick Ringe, who, uh, in addition to owning the Rancho Topanga Malibu, <laughs> um, beautiful ranch, was vice president of Union Oil Company and a director of SoCal Edison. 
So here's their ranch. It covered 20 miles of the most spectacular real estate in California on the coast from Santa Monica to Oxnard, some 13,000 acres. And here's, here's May right here. When her husband died, May became the only female owner of a railroad uh, in the United States. That's because they created their own railroad to keep the Southern Pacific out of their area, which they did successfully. So she founded the pottery at Surfrider Beach to create materials for construction projects on the ranch and later on for revenue uh, when the entire Malibu venture fell on hard times in the Depression. So here's Adamson House, built by her daughter and son-in-law, now open to the public as a state park. Uh, gorgeous place and gorgeous location, clearly. Uh, this rivals Batchelder's chocolate shop in extensive and eccentric use of tile. Let's see some. Here we have a beautiful fountain. And we have the interiors are really have a lot, oh, a lot of tile in them, including <laughs> one among the most amazing things in the house is this 60 foot simulated Persian carpet made of 674 tiles, complete with fringe detail. Uh, this is considered the largest Persian carpet made of tile known to exist, um, although there are others. <laughs> Malibu closed its operations in 1932. When May died in 1942, her unfinished castle, 26 acres of land, and thousands of crated Malibu pottery's tiles were sold to the Franciscan order for $50,000. So the Franciscans still have a retreat uh, in the area. And I believe in that retreat, there is one of the uh, tiled Persian rugs, but it's not as big as the original one here. So another millionaire, yet another millionaire figures in the story of the other dominant Southern California pottery of the era. And he's William Wrigley, chewing gum magnate, owner of the Chicago Cubs and owner of Catalina Island. He established the Catalina Clay Products Company in 1925 to provide inexpensive bricks from the local red clay for the resort he was developing, the casino and everything. But by 1927, the pottery was crafting richly glazed tiles of geometric design in colors like orange, cobalt, green, yellow, and black. Okay, here's some of their dishware. Uh, the local red clay was plentiful, but it tended to crumble, as terracotta does. Uh, so the pottery began importing white clay from the mainland. Everything was sold to Gladding McBean in 1937, and production was moved onto the mainland to avoid the cost of importing the clay. And their production ceased in 1942. So these uh, wonderful uh, coffee pots and the um, uh, fish ashtray <laughs> there, the objects you see here were um, produced by Gladding McBean after they acquired the molds from Catalina Pottery in 1937. So here again, we can see that uh, ocean life, fish, things like this, shells, very important. Once again, uh, referencing the local flora and fauna in their, in their designs. So as the depression of the 1930s begins, tabletop becomes the dominant product of the big five California potteries. And California potteries become the dominant producers of modern casual American tableware. These are the biggest producers, but there were up to 300 uh, small factories producing tableware at this time. With its oranges, avocados, and year-round sunshine, California, especially Southern California, was already a brand. And so tiles and garden pottery in these uh, Mexican colors lead the way and were quickly followed by the inexpensive and cheerful daily dishware that would provide a moment of happiness in that dreadful decade. Now, unlike depression glass, which imitated old fashioned designs, California's ultra colorful tableware was completely new, even though it's hard for those of us who buy things from Pottery Barn, from Crate and Barrel or from Ikea to imagine how unusual and radical this pottery was. In this decade of unprecedented ceramic production, Potters were inspired by everything, footed bowls from Mexico, Japanese teapots, American 19th century tin coffee pots, and of course, striking Art Deco designs from Europe. Now, 
Eastern potteries, most American potteries comes from the East, had, had experimented with bright solid colors such as we see on California pottery. But they did it by either blending pigments into the clay or by painting on the surface and covering that with a clear glaze. But in California, the commercial viability of these products came with the discovery that talc, which was a plentiful mineral in California, helped create a clay body that bound with solid color glazes, producing an intense, uniform, and durable product. The dishes were ideal for casual outdoor dining on patios and such. So let's look at some of their cool works. So over on the left there by Metlocks, those are candle holders in that spiral pattern. And the Pintoria uh, by Metlocks at the top there, really interesting square plates, right? With a central uh, circle in them, very European sort of design. And down below them, um, that is a... Um, um, refrigerator stack. Basically, it's for leftovers <laughs> before you had Tupperware and so forth, but super elegant, really. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, so these companies produced a wide range of products, things like ashtrays, cigarette boxes, and casserole dishes that we would nowadays not consider part of a dinner service, no matter how casual. And of these five, Franciscan, Franciscan was actually a division of Blatting McBean, and they chose the name Franciscan because the missions in California were Franciscan missions, again, to connect with the um, romantic uh, mission era California vibe. Uh, let's see. Now, Pacific created a 90-piece hostessware line available in six colors. So this is part of a child set um, with the bunnies. They're just wonderful. So can you even name 90 tableware items? How about a bean pot? Got to have that in a one gallon or individual size or a punch cup or a Tom and Jerry cup. Those are different bowls for oatmeal and bowls for onion soup, cups for sherbet and custard, a footed tumbler, and don't forget your martini pitcher right there. Or you might also need a waffle batter and maple syrup set. The one with the long spout is for the maple syrup, a must have for every depression era home. But as you know, um, Art in the 1930s had two faces, the severe European inspired modernism, which is reflected in painting by surrealism and abstraction, and a homegrown rustic face reflected in the mural art of the WPA with artists like Thomas Hart Benton and the Coit Tower artists in San Francisco. And in pottery, this homely trend appears too, as the potteries moved from exclusively solid color to decorated wares. Uh, the most prolific pottery in this line came from Vernon, and they created some amazing things. Illustrator Rockwell Kent crafted a range based on his illustrations for Moby Dick, and he had a series called Our America that includes this coffee pot inspired by the creation of the Bay Bridge. I so want this coffee pot. I just think it's wonderful. And of course, they contracted with Disney to produce movie tie-in pottery and figurines and tchotchkes and so forth. Now, there were lots of patterned wares in this Americana trend, such as this, uh, Metlox's Poppy Trail, which I grew up with. The best-selling American dinnerware of all time, Franciscan's Desert Rose. Uh, Franciscan, as I said, was produced by Gladding McBean in LA from 1934 right up into the 60s. Uh, this is still produced, but it's Franciscan is now part of WWRD, Wedgwood Waterford Royal Dalton, which continues to, to produce it. But the heyday of orange, lime green, cobalt, and delphinium pottery wares came to an end during World War II, when most of the California potters turned their production to wartime efforts, dinnerware for Navy ships and ceramic anti-tank mines, things like that. Uh, and American dishware that was produced was more conservative in imitation of the floral kind of English wares that were no longer being imported. In the post-war period, however, California was once again in the forefront of American design in the era that we now call mid-century modernism, where we have the stall house in LA and this 
absolutely rocking Eames chair. This was a great time. Post-war artists were inspired by Bauhaus principles of good design made available to all. So unlike the arts and crafts period craftsmen of the turn of the century who disdained the concept of mass production, post-war modernists tried to harness the two using modern production methods to offset the high cost of handmade goods. The big five potteries themselves took up the trend and they actually produced some wonderful wares, including the Jetsons looking set down there by Metlocks. And uh, on the right, these three uh, objects are machine made, they're not handmade, but the glazes make them look so. These are all designed uh, by Russell Wright for Bauer. And the mid-century modern period produced a number of celebrated individual craftsmen and craftswomen. You may have noticed that we haven't seen too many women ceramicists since the tuberculosis patients at, at Arequipa. And while there are dozens of interesting uh, ceramic artists in the post-war years, I just want to introduce you to three of the women of the California clay tradition. And uh, the first one, uh, and probably the most important, is Edith Heath. She wanted to make her pottery available to those who could not afford handmade items. This put her at odds with the post-war studio potter community, but Heath believed that the machine was just a tool. Only the artist potter who puts respect for humane values above mechanical marvels will be able to harness the machine to do man's highest aesthetic biddings, she said. So she always thought that the machine was just a tool. It was still an artist craftsperson um, making the pot. Um, Heath Ceramics in Sausalito uh, established a new standard in tabletop and tile by embracing a philosophy of evolution rather than revolution of continually refining her designs, her glazes and her production to create wares that last and defy trends. So Edith, who was the oldest of seven children of a Danish immigrant family, grew up on an Iowa farm, which failed as the depression began. And she remembered the family auctioning off everything they had and everything sold except the piano and their Haviland China, both of which were too expensive for anybody to afford. This taught Edith to disdain useless, superfluous objects, and this attitude would combine with her discovery of Bauhaus design philosophy when she was at school in Chicago to really inform her life's work. So Edith and her husband Brian moved to San Francisco in 1941. Once here, she audited classes in ceramics at the Art Institute and Brian managed to convert an old treadle-powered sewing machine into a potter's wheel, and they installed a gas-fired kiln in the basement below their flat. Heath became an expert in clay chemistry and was fascinated by eutectics, the science of mixing various metals into clay to alter its properties and particularly to allow it to harden at a lower temperature. The Heaths would drive around the West Coast for fun, gathering buckets of native clays to take home and experiment with. There she is in the center, the only woman, of course. She hated white porcelain-like clays. The body of a Heath ceramic still is a combination of two clays found in the Northern Sierra foothills where an inland sea had deposited a clay with unique properties. Um, this is actually the same clay that's used at Gladding McBean there in the same area. Uh, in the kitchen, she experimented with glaze formulas and she fused the clay and the glaze together in a single firing, which produced textural and tonal colorations similar to those found in rocks and pebbles. So uh, this was unusual that the clay and the glaze that she only fired at once, that's obviously much more conservative in terms of the amount of energy you're using. In 1944, the Legion of Honor hosted a one woman show of Heath's work and she was discovered by a buyer for Gumps who approached her and uh, asked her to make dinnerware sets for Gumps in their pottery studio, which was on Clay Street. Other retailers approached her and in 1948, uh, Heath Ceramics was born with just four dinnerware designs. But these designs were an instant success. Frank Lloyd Wright specified Heath dinnerware for some of his projects and so did Joseph Eichler. Uh, LA's famous case study houses were styled with Heath accessories. Heath produced tiles too, which were always individually crafted. 
Um, like those of our arts and crafts friend, Ernest Batchelder, no two were exactly alike. They can be seen, here she is uh, installing them or supervising anyway. They can be seen here on the exterior of the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, which features 115,000 glazed tiles in varying brown tones. Uh, they're on the Yerba Buena Center in San Francisco and they're at LACMA. For her tiles, she was the first non-architect to win an American Institute of Architects gold medal. Uh, so Heath died in 2005, she was 94. Uh, Heath Ceramics, which is still going, has been operated by Robin Petrovic and Catherine Bailey since 2003. It's one of the few mid-century American potteries still in existence. Heath's coop line here has been in constant production since 1948 with periodic changes to the texture and the color of the glazes. And it still takes 12 people to make a Heath plate. Let's see, here's the um, uh, Chez Panisse uh, tableware that was designed with uh, the help of Alice Waters. This is interesting. Um, one of their giant uh, products made them a great deal of money was this ashtray designed by Brian uh, that you, when you put the cigarette in the slot, when the ash, when it burns and the ash hits the side of the ashtray, it goes out. So it's a safety ashtray and thousands of them were bought by the state of California for offices. It's kind of cool. Uh, this plaza line was the last uh, one designed by Edith in the 1980s. And here is an example uh, of a coop cup by, uh, um, by Bailey by Catherine Bailey uh, in the collection at SF MoMA, and you can see why. It's just simple and gorgeous and elegant. So this is the machine-assisted style of pottery making, handmade with the uh, assistance of machines. The other side in uh, post-war and 60s era pottery in the area was approached by Marguerite Wildenhain, who was herself a Bauhaus-trained sculptor and ceramicist she had an apprenticeship at the Bauhaus for six years, beginning in 1919. She was the first female master there. She worked with Walter Gropius. But despite their similar training, Wildenhain and Edith Heath disagreed about the role of the machine in artistic work. But they were both successful ceramicists who both sold their work at Gump's. After her years at Bauhaus, Wildenhain began designing porcelain tableware, vases, and other objects like this for Royal Berlin to mass produce. But at this point, she was just a designer. She was not fabricating pots herself. But these modern unadorned designs followed the Bauhaus doctrine, form follows function. And her wares were shown in London, Paris, Brussels, Amsterdam, and New York. Wildenhain understood the necessity of mass production and uh, agreed with Heath that only a designer craftsman versed in the craft can create pottery designs of lasting value, but they really disagreed on how active the artist's hand needed to be. In 1940, Wildenhain fled the Nazi regime, uh, moving first to Holland and then to California. In 1942, with the help of architect Gordon Herr, Wildenhain founded Pond Farm, an arts community in Guerneville, in Northern California. She lived and worked at Pond Farm until her death in 1985, becoming an influential mentor and teacher to generations of ceramic artists. For Wildenhain, pottery was more than an art form or a profession. It was a way of life that promoted technical skills and a love of craft. Pond Farm had summer sessions beginning in around 1949. Students came from around the world to accept her challenge. They had to learn pottery by never keeping a pot. In other words, they focused on the formation of the pot rather than firing and glazing. All the wares were returned to nature, returned back into clay, um, as she thought the learning was in the process, not the product. She continued to teach until 1979 and threw her last pot in 1980. Six years later, she died. So she became known for these kind of earth colored semi matte ceramics. Her work is not ornament free and it has a more holistic approach maybe than most and much Bauhaus production. 
Many of her works have a figurative surface inspired by local plants and animals. Once again, the local flora and fauna produce um, a turn up on our local pottery where the stone angel candelabra there is at uh, the Oakland Museum. And much of the many of the other works I'm showing you are from a collection at Luther College in Iowa, where um, an early director had been a student at Pond Farm and collected quite a bit of uh, Wildenhain's work. Since her death in 1985, the Department of Parks has maintained, here it is, the historic property uh, Pond Farm in Guerneville using a policy of arrested decay. Fundraising is underway to restore it, helped by a designation last year um, uh, on the National Register of Historic Places. So finally, the last uh, artist craftswoman I want to introduce you to is Jade Snow Wong, a talented artist in many media. She created both ceramics and enamel wares and might be best known to you as the author of a memoir, The Fifth Chinese Daughter, published in 1950 and actually a Book of the Month Club selection that year. Uh, Jade Snow Wong was born in January 1922 on a rare snowy day in San Francisco, the fifth daughter in a family of nine children. She was raised with traditional beliefs about what women could and could not do, and she struggled to balance her Chinese background with her American surroundings. She was focused on higher education and first attended San Francisco uh, Community College, later Mills College, where she majored in economics and sociology and hoped to become a social worker. But there was a required craft course, which she took, taught by the noted California ceramicist, uh, F. Carlton Ball, and she became intrigued by the medium. And after a six week summer school course with the same ceramicist, she stepped off her career path and changed the course of her life. So her career in pottery took off after she convinced a merchant on Grant Avenue in Chinatown to allow her to put her workshop in the store window. And her works uh, found popularity, but not as she tells us uh, in her 1976 work, No Chinese Stranger, not with the local Chinese community. She said, from the first, the local Chinese were not Jade Snow's patrons. She refers to herself as Jade Snow in this work. The thinness and whiteness of porcelains imported from China and ornate decorations, which came into vogue during the late Qing dynasty satisfied their taste. They could not understand why Americans paid dollars for a hand-thrown bowl utilizing crude California clays, not much different from the inexpensive peasant wear of China, that the Jade Snow Wong bowl went back to an older tradition of understated beauty was not apparent. They could only see that she would not apply a dragon or a hundred flowers, All right? So let's look at some of her beautiful works. Again, sort of in a much more handmade tradition, studio potter tradition, local clays. A great deal of her work, uh, she donated to the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. You can see it there. In 1952, she was asked to do a one woman show of her pottery and enamel work at the Art Institute of Chicago. And her work has been exhibited at the De Young, at SF MoMA, MoMA New York and the Smithsonian, and of course, as I said, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And she died uh, in 2006 at the age of 84, having received an honorary doctorate from Mills. So I wanna finish tonight with a supremely artistic kind of tabletop, dinner plates designed to make a statement, to raise consciousness, to shock even. They appeared in 1979 on a table, a really big triangular table at SF MoMA, followed by 16 venues in six countries on three continents to a viewing audience of over a million people. And they now reside at the Brooklyn Museum. Of course, I'm talking about the 39 place settings of Judy Chicago's dinner party. Judy Chicago, a California ceramicist. Each place setting includes a hand-painted china plate, ceramic cutlery and chalice, and a napkin with an embroidered gold edge, 
and the settings rest on beautifully embroidered runners. And the big table stands on the heritage floor made up of more than 2000 triangular white luster glazed porcelain tiles, each inscribed in gold script with the name of one of 998 women and one man who have made a mark on history. Uh, the man was included by mistake as people thought he was a woman. Naturally, the work produced an extraordinary level of controversy. Some found it lacking as art because it was comprised of female-centric craft skills performed by a huge team of volunteers. Others thought it didn't even qualify as communal work because Chicago retained control over the entire process. The plates especially came in for severe criticism. They become increasingly three-dimensional as they move from prehistoric to contemporary subjects. This was intended to represent the rise of women in all ways throughout history. And some look like flowers and butterflies, but they also resemble female genitalia, which many people found disturbing. Even some feminist critics were uncomfortable reducing women in this way to this essential element especially in regards to women like Virginia Woolf, who fought against the public's curiosity about the sex of writers, or Emily Dickinson, such a private person, or even Georgia O'Keeffe, who denied that her flowers, which as we see here, were sexualized. But another criticism was that one plate, the plate of the only black woman represented, Sojourner Truth, was not sexual enough. It does not feature any genitalia at all. So perhaps you would like to make a provocative statement at your next dinner party, which once again, I think it's gonna be outside. If so, you're in luck. Chicago has adapted four of the plates from her installation into two dimensional versions that are being sold in addition sets by a company called Prospect New York. Rounding out the collection are pillows based on the banners and table runners and a puzzle based on the installation's floor. There we have them, Sappho, Primordial Goddess, Elizabeth R, and Amazon. So there we are, oh, we're right on time. Uh, this is where I'm gonna end and it looks like there are some questions or comments in the chat, I think. Yes, indeed, we do have quite a few questions for okay. you. <laughs> um, so starting right towards the beginning, I guess, um, you had mentioned the arts and crafts movement in California. Could you talk a little bit more about what made it distinct from arts and crafts in other areas of the country? Well, it was very similar, certainly. I think one of the big uh, differences or aspects of it was, in fact, the um, use of California motifs, which you would not see other places. But in many ways, it was it was quite similar, of course. And as American arts and crafts, it all comes from what was going on in England. Um, William Morris and so forth. But I think, for instance, if you think of Arthur and Lucia Matthews, um, their painting, Arthur Matthews paintings of California, California women, uh, healthy and vibrant and out in a landscape that is recognizably that of Northern California. I think I would say that that's probably the most distinctive aspect of uh, arts and crafts um, uh, in California. Yeah, uh, we just got a question that I'll sneak in there. Are you going to speak about Bauer? Um, someone owns, Lori owns the picture that was featured in the ad for this event, which was inherited from her grandmother and has oh, some information. Yeah, so cool. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I did. <laughs> Bauer got, uh, you know, was one of the big five. Um, Bauer, interestingly, along with Heath is still in production. It's not the original Bauer. It, somebody um, 20 or so years ago, maybe 15 years ago, bought the name, bought the company and Bauer still does produce uh, similar wares in California. And that first picture, that said Big Five, that warehouse, that's their contemporary warehouse, downtown Los Angeles, where you can go to, to buy things. But yeah, um, yeah, Bauer is a, a great uh, maker. Yeah, good. <laughs> so no. Speaking of purchasing, um, are, there was a question around, are Batchelder tiles still available? Or are they only available if they happen to come up for auction these days? <sighs> I don't think anybody is making batch elder tiles. Malibu tiles are made. There's a company that's making them in Los Angeles. Batch elder tiles, I, I don't know. Um, 
<laughs> I didn't check that. Uh, you might have to scrap around for them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it would be lovely to have some. I should check yeah. that. Um, and then are many of this, or are all of the styles that you talked about today shown at the Oakland Museum or are they scattered around at different California museums? They're scattered around. Oakland has a pretty good collection. Um, I noticed last time I was in there, they do have that martini picture, um, <laughs> that fabulous thing in there. Um, they probably have less of the, well, they have that, they have that uh, martini picture, less in that area, or that's on display right now. I mean, they have 100,000 objects stashed away someplace. Uh, I think they have uh, overall a pretty good range of production from all periods in California. Certainly right now when you go in there, there's lot, there's Eric Keepa, there's California Fiance, there's lots of um, arts and crafts art pottery in there. And mm. some, uh, some others, and of course, as I didn't mention, the Edith Heath exhibit that's right now at Oakland, which I hope you will all go see. It's a true Oakland style exhibit in that it's not just a bunch of uh, plates and pictures and stuff on shelves. It's really about her, her factory, how clay is produced, how the wares were produced, the sort of social conditions in which she was working. And there's a lot of stuff about the actual factory. Factory, it's not really a factory in Sausalito, the way it was designed. Everybody who worked in there had a view of Richardson Bay. I mean, it was designed uh, to provide a healthful and uh, inspiring workplace for people. So the exhibit is really interesting in that regard. So I hope you all go. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. I will have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of Edith Heath, Heath was the glaze experimentation that kind of defined her work. Was that something that was happening on a similar scale with other artists in the area or other areas in the country? Or was that fairly unique to her? Well, certainly what she did was, was unique. I mean, she did it in her kitchen. I mean, the thing is that the, at the time she was actually auditing a class at the Art Institute. So they didn't have enough pottery wheels. You know, the auditors had to get in the back of the line. So they came up with this, they did it at home. So I think that um, anybody who is creating clay works uh, is working with glazes all the time and trying to find new ones. But for somebody individually to be working with different clays and combine them, it's called a clay body. It's almost always composed of more than one kind of clay uh, that she hit on one. I think she was pretty much um, on her own doing that. I don't think uh, many other individuals would, would do that so much. And she, you know, the clay that they would be given to work with at school, you know, would be something from an art supply house or whatever. And this was not good enough for her. She wanted to create her own, which, which she did. But one thing, I mean, her use of local clays is really stressed and everything that, um, that we present about her at Oakland. But uh, California has clay has been used right from the start at the beginning because it was hard to get anything else. <laughs> and then in her case, because that was exactly what she wanted was local clays. It's fantastic. And just to round out with what looks like our last question, um, do you know how long Jade Snow did her pottery in the storefront in Chinatown? I don't, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> And Probably uh, not not terribly long, but um, she she that was that was pretty out there, right? To to do that, so I don't know how long she did that. <laughs> were any of her works sold at Gumps, or was it just through that storefront? I don't know if she sold her works at Gumps. It wouldn't surprise me if she did. Um, I mean, at the time she was working in the window, possibly not. But I think later on um, she became a quite well respected potter, and I don't know if her works were sold at Gumps. I should check. Because <laughs> that's the stamp of approval, right? If you sold yeah. it young, that's like, that's really good. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I believe looking through, that is it. We do have quite a few thank yous and that this was very interesting. Okay. Um, and exactly what people were interested in. Oh, was that's a beautiful that's, presentation. That's well, yeah. I do agree. So those of you at home, please join me in giving for a virtual round of applause. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you so much for your time. Thank I, you for coming and being interested in dishes. <laughs> yeah. I'm certainly looking forward to whenever we see you next as well with whatever you bring us next. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so now to give you all a quick preview of a few upcoming Friends events. On May 16th at 5 p.m., we will have an author talk with national best-selling author Gail Sukiyama discussing her book, The Color of Air, which is a historical novel about a Japanese-American family set against the backdrop of Hawaii's sugar plantations. Our next Art Docent Talk will be on June 1st at 7 p.m. 
She'll be taking us behind the scenes of Bouquets to Art, which is one of the most popular events at the Fine Art Museums of San Francisco. Additionally, we will also have our next pop-up book sale on Saturday, June 25th from 12 to 4 p.m. The book sale will focus on summer family reading. And if you can't make it that day, or even if you can, every week we have sales happening at Books for Friends, which is now open at the main library from 12 to 4 on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Stop on by and peruse the shelves for your next read. Um, please register for these upcoming events, visit, tell your friends. We greatly appreciate your support. You can also view our website, newsletter, and Facebook page for additional events and information. If you're comfortable to do so, please consider a donation to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com or via the link in the chat. And finally, I would like to give special recognition to our production team, Karen Butter, Kumar Fonse, David Beal, Karen Romer, Karen Manuel, Becky Sear, and Billy Reinschmidt. Thank you again to Averill for presenting this evening, and many thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a wonderful evening.